name is Thomas Finos, and my wife and I joined this congregation of faith about six months ago. Uh, I've been writing, I've been writing Christian poetry for about 20, 25 years. Uh, this is something I wrote a long time ago, about 20 years ago, and I literally rediscovered it. But looking through my poetry, and I'd like to share it with you. This is Advent song. Hope comes to us at Christmas time in the infant Jesus. Hope of salvation of a new and better tomorrow. Hope of a new life in Christ Jesus. Hope of a soul washed whiter than snow. Joy comes to us at Christmas time with the birth of Jesus. Joy of eternal life, my days on earth have ended. Joy of God's saving grace raining down on me. Joy of God's company even in the darkest hour. Peace comes to us at Christmas time in the sleeping Savior, Jesus. Peace of mind, heart, and soul. Peace of God which overwhelms us, his children. Peace even in times of trouble. Love comes to us at Christmas time from God our Father above. Love of God which we will never fully understand. Love of our Father to all his creation. Love of Christ Jesus who took our place on the cross. Hope, joy, peace, love of God who cares for all of us. Of Jesus who is our Savior, Redeemer, and Friend. Of the Holy Spirit who is our guide. Be with us now and forevermore. Be our strength and shield in all parts of our lives. Amen. Amen. We're going to have Rob Thompson come forward for the reading of this morning's passage. Rob. Peace to those who whom his favor rests. 
When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the, sixth, on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus. The name the angel had given him before he was conceived. His birth 2, 
2,000 years ago. So amazing that you would step into time and space to let us know that you care. That's the beauty of Christmas. You let us know that you care. You're not distant. You're not up on a throne uncaring, but you would care so much that you would send your son into this dark world to break light like dawn into our hearts that we might know the truth, that you love us, that you forgive us, that eternal life is waiting for us, for those who believe in Christ. So grateful for this truth that we celebrate at Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen. I think the most wonderful, no, I don't think I know. I know the most wonderful moment in human history is when Christ died on the cross. The Son of God died on wooden beams nailed there by cruel Romans, put there by a nation who rejected him, his own people, Israel. What a wonderful moment that day that he died on the cross, providing forgiveness for each one of us who would look to him for salvation. That was the most wonderful moment. I think the most greatest moment in human history was when Christ rose from the dead. And that big stone was rolled away by the angel. And Christ came to life and stepped out. New, fresh, raised from the dead, raised back to life, the Son of God. And now he has the authority and the power and the purpose to raise each of us back to life from whatever grave all of us are going to end up in one day. When Christ returns, he raises the dead. And I think that was the greatest moment in human history, along with the most wonderful moment in human history when Christ died to pay the price for our sin. Today we're going to talk about the brightest moment in human history. When God's own Son was born by the Virgin Mary and delivered in a little barn of animals late at night underneath the stars, and she laid him in that hay, and he was probably all steamy and warm, you know. And there lay the Son of God, God in the flesh. God became a human being. You just need to let that sink in. You know, I've been reading this story since, hearing the story, reading the story since I was a little boy. But what I've noticed over these last couple years is that I appreciate the story more and more. I just see it for what it is. And it's so marvelous and so wonderful and so beautiful that God would become a human being. In this story, we see that Joseph is really in the thick of it. <laughs> this blue-collar carpenter from the little town of Nazareth in Galilee. He was betrothed to this teenage girl, this little beauty down the street named Mary. And all of a sudden, she had become pregnant. And he wanted to do the right thing and just divorce her quietly, not bring any disgrace to her or the family. That was good of Joseph. That revealed his heart. He was a good man. But then an angel spoke to Joseph in a dream. Hey, you big dummy. <laughs> what that little teenage beauty Mary told you the other day about what is conceived inside her is of the Spirit of God. That is true, my friend. That is true, Joseph. By the way, in the dream, the angel tells Joseph, someone, you, Joseph, someone from the house of David, reminding him of who he was. Hey, you're in the line of David. The Messiah, the Christ child, comes from the line of David. And guess what, Joseph? It's you. It's this generation. It's you and Mary. So Joseph wakes up from the dream totally convinced, and decides to take Mary to be his wife. Now, during this time, his little teenage bride, she was less than 19, we know that, she's probably around 16 years old, is our best biblical guess. Joseph probably had eight to 10 years on her, 
Because, you know, the guy's got to be older than the girl, because the girl's always so much smarter than the guy. We all know that, right? <laughs> and so, this young man is with this teenage bride, and she's nine months pregnant. I mean, she's ready to drop the child. <laughs> so, they're under the oppression of Roman Empire, you know? And they all call this census, hey, listen, guys, you need to go back to your hometowns, your home villages, and you need to register for the census so we can keep track of you. And they're doing that today, right? So we can keep track of you, same thing. So he's got to travel from the northern town of Nazareth through Galilee, past Jerusalem, down south to the town of Bethlehem, the town of David. And that is one long journey especially for a pregnant teenage girl riding on a little donkey. Now, you can imagine what that trip was like. <laughs> so, this is how God is coming into the world. And I read this story, and I am completely amazed. And I hope you are, too. So, Joseph, being a blue-collar, nitty-gritty, get-it-done person, and I appreciate that. One of, Christine knows one of my mottos is, you know, Get it done. <laughs> Whatever it is. So he says, I've got to get her on the donkey. We're going to travel all the way down south to Bethlehem to register. Because the Roman Empire, you know, that's how they are. They're so impressive. And so he does that. But when he ends up in Bethlehem, and I'm telling the top of the story here in chapter 2 of Luke, as they enter the little town of Bethlehem, you know, the place is packed out because everyone's there registering. And, and there's no more motel six rooms available there's nothing all the people's homes are filled and so i love this thing about joseph he's got to make a way get it done make a way my teenage bride is about to drop the child so in the in, in the cool of the night everyone's turning in there's nothing left joseph spots a cave or a barn where the animals are hunkered down in the hay. There's probably some ox, some sheep. And he says, hey, we're going to make this work, right? So he takes his little bride into there. He fluffs up the hay for her to lay in. He fluffs up some hay in a feeding trough, probably of a sheep. Don't miss the irony. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Don't miss the irony. <laughs> and so she gives birth. And Joseph is a new dad, and he's, I guess, cutting the umbilical cord and laying the steamy little Jewish baby in the hay. And I bet he looked amazing. I mean, I bet he was kind of shiny, is my guess. <laughs> because he was the Son of God, and the Spirit of God was residing in a little baby human being. I bet there was, like, starlight coming out of his eyes. So, Joe, here they are. I just wanted to retell the story, and here they are in this manger. And it says here in verse 7, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths, swaddling cloths, and placed him in a manger, placed, placed him in a feeding trough, because there were no guest rooms available for them. And also going on that night, out in the fields, not far away, surrounding the little town of Bethlehem. Verse 8, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were terrified. Supernatural event, seeing an angel in the sky, this glory shining from him, they... We're just blue collar, nobody shepherds in a little backwater town of Bethlehem. They see this angel in the night sky, and of course they're going to be terrified. They've never seen anything like it before. They were terrified, the scripture says. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be freaked out. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. See, that's, that's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of the birth of Christ. It is good news. It will bring great joy for those who believe in Christ and accept Him as Savior. The great joy is that uh, there's light in this dark world. 
God has stepped into this dark world. God has said to me that I love you, I forgive you, I'm making a way out of this nightmare for you. This world that's dark and sinful and full of disease and death and injustice. It was God making a way out. And that's why the angel said, it's good news. And it's going to bring great joy for people who understand it. For people who accept it. For people who believe in it. It'll bring great joy. It goes on to say that, do not be afraid. It'll bring you great joy. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. This will be a sign unto you. You will find the babe wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The reason that was a sign is because you would never see a freshly born Jewish baby lying in a stall full of animals late at night, wrapped in clothes and lying in a feeding trough of a lamb. That was something you just never saw. And that's why it would be a sign. When you find that kid, that's the one. So they, you know, these blue collar, rough dudes that probably don't smell too good because they've been around sheep all day. They go wandering into Bethlehem, the town of David. Don't miss it, the town of David. All the prophets talked about the Messiah coming through the line of David. And he is going to sit on the throne of David. And he is going to rule with an iron scepter and rule with mercy and justice and equity forever and ever. And this Messiah would come from the town of David, come from the town and the line of David. He would be the Savior. He would be the long-predicted Messiah. Whenever you see that word Messiah, it means that all the prophets, starting with Abraham, starting with Noah, they were prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Micah, they all talked about Christ as this coming Messiah. A better word for us today, especially in America, would be rescuer, deliverer. He rescues, he delivers from sin and death and shame and disease. He rescues. So he says here, in the town of David, a Messiah, the Lord will be born. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. This was the verse that just kind of lifted off the page and stuck with me all week, this verse 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. He is the Lord. And I think that's what makes this moment in time, in human history, being the brightest moment, is the fact that He was the Lord. He was God's Son. He was the King of Kings. He was eternal, majestic, powerful, sat on a throne, speaking universes into place, sitting next to his Heavenly Father, who's also called the Ancient of Days. And he's got, as Isaiah recorded in Isaiah chapter 6, and there's angels called seraphim and cherubim. Thank you, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good Bible student. <laughs> Seraphim and cherubim, they're, they're flying around the throne saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of His glory. He made this planet. He made all these living, breathing creatures and things that are beyond imagination with design and ingenuity and artistry and beauty. It's interesting that the angels always say things like that. Hey, he's holy. He's ancient. He's perfect. He's powerful. He was around doing things even before this planet came into existence. Do you know who he is? The angels do. It says that the angels have six wings. <laughs> have you ever seen a creature with six wings? With one they covered their face. With one they covered their feet, with one they flew, and they never stopped singing out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is full of His glory. This one sitting on the throne, this Lord of Lord and King of Kings, 
He was the one born in that hay. Mm -hmm. A human, a, a God of creation and eternity. He became a human being. That is the story of Christmas. You know, I hate to, you know, I've, I've been born and raised in America. This is a great land. A land that was founded in faith. Of course, we've wandered far, far away from that faith. But, you know, leave it to America to mess it all up. You know? For most of Americans, it's about some big guy in a red suit and a tree full of lights and all these wrappings and all this shopping and all this glamour and glitz. Hey, it's a lot of fun. It is. But it's not what it's about. And see, as God's servant here in this place, I have to remind us what it's all about. It's about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the line of David coming off his throne and becoming a human being and lying in a hay in a manger born to a blue-collar couple. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. That God would be so kind. That God would be so humble. Humble. That, that's what strikes me about the story. That's what strikes me as I began to review the prophecies in Isaiah, review what the gospel writers wrote in Matthew and Luke. I was impressed. I was amazed at the humility of God to reach out to us. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would become a human being. You know, uh, even the uh, angels are impressed with this. Even the angels are, ama are amazed at this, you know. We should be amazed, and the angels are amazed. I thought of something that the Apostle Peter said in his first letter. He said about this very thing about Christ's coming and the salvation and the grace that it would bring to mankind. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, it says, Concerning this salvation, concerning the Messiah, that the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently as to when, with greatest care as to when this would happen, to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the suffering of the Messiah and the glories that would come. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, these prophets and apostles, they were not only serving themselves, Peter says to the congregation he's preaching to, but they were serving you. So when I stand up here and read the words of God from the prophets and the apostles, they are serving you. So that you would know the truth, that you would know about Christ, that you would know how to live the Christian life. It goes on to say, when they spoke of these things that have now been told to you, by those who have preached the gospel to you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, who's been sent from heaven, I want you to know, the last part of the paragraph, even the angels, even the angels long to look into these things. Can you imagine the seraphim and the cherub, the cherubim? The mere, the, and in the scriptures it says there's myriads of angels, meaning like there's so many you can't count them. They like, you can see them all the way to the horizon. They're in the throne room. They're praising, they're flying, they're serving. They're called the flaming servants of God in the original language. That's the best English words we come up with because they're, they're like bright, they're glowing. It looks like they're on fire. And they're always praising and serving God. And it says that these angels even long to look into these things about when Christ would bring salvation as the Messiah. Can you imagine the angels like, Wait, wait, wait. Did we hear the prophet right? Are we getting the story right in heaven? You mean Christ? Yeshua is his name. Emmanuel is his name. Alpha and Omega, the true and faithful one, the very Son of God, the Lamb of God, those are his names. You, you mean that he's going to come off his throne, step out of heaven, and step into a human child and be a human being? What? It says here, they were amazed and they longed to look into this thing like, what is God up to now? I'm sure that God was blowing their minds like all the time. I think it's pretty remarkable. 
This, this God was stepping into human flesh, becoming a baby child in the little town of Bethlehem, born of a virgin Mary, who was just a teenage bride. And even the angels were amazed at the coming of the Messiah and all the steps that took place for that to unfold. You know, Jesus Christ, you know, in Scripture we learn that He's the creator of all things. See, God the Father sits on His throne, but His Son is the one who's out and about doing stuff, creating things, creating this world. It's clear from the Scripture that He is the creator of all things. All things are made by Him, all things are made for Him, and all things find their meaning in Him. Colossians chapter 1. And so Jesus Christ... He was the one that made the stars and spoke them into place. He was the one that formed the foundations of this world. He spoke the stars and he's got a name for each one. Do you know that? So there's like billions and trillions of stars, countless stars, and Jesus has a name for each one. Jesus Christ was the one who breathed life into Adam and then made Eve from his rib. So he made human sculptures out of clay and then breathe life into them and they stood up and become a human being. That's what the scriptures say. And this was the person creating time and space, speaking stars into place, breathing life into mankind. Jesus Christ, the creator of the world. Now he was going to become mankind. And this is the beauty of Christmas. And why would he do that? To be the Messiah? To bring salvation to a lost world? Look at the response. Look at the response of the angels and the shepherds. Because as we read this story, we might think, you know, Pastor Troy, I get it. It's a beautiful, miraculous story. How should we, how should we respond? What should we think of? How should we feel? Here, 2,000 years later, we should feel the same way they felt on the night that it happened. Listen to verse 13. After they found the baby wrapped in cloth, suddenly a great company of living hosts, of heavenly hosts, appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone back into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go into Bethlehem, let's go into the little town of David and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the babies. Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had seen and what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. So in this Bethlehem night with Joseph and Mary in the stall with this freshly born baby and now the shepherds are coming to that stall because they saw an angel in the sky that said, that said to them, go look and go find him and go see him. And then they had angels appear in the sky and sing praises about this glorious thing that had happened. And as they saw the angels sing, as they saw the child in the hay, it says here that they went out and began to spread the word concerning what they had seen about this child. And so as Christians, as believers today in this year in which we find ourselves, I think it would be good for us to respond the same way. To praise God for His glory and His mercy and His salvation through this Christ child. To praise God in the highest because now there's peace on earth, goodwill towards men. And to be like the shepherds. It says that after they saw the child and heard the angels, it says in verse 17, they went out to the word. They went out to spread the word concerning what they had seen about this child. And so that's us. 
We praise God like the angels for what he's doing because we can see it the way they see it. And we can be like the shepherds. Now these were just average, blue-collar nobodies. Their names aren't even recorded. They were nobodies. But once they saw, and once they heard, and once they knew about the child, it says here that they went out and spread the word. And see, that's what we do. That's what I get the chance to do when I stand up here. I get to read the story, retell the story, and spread the word. And now it's up to us, to you, to spread that word too about the Christ child. To your family, to your friends, to your neighbors. And we get a chance to sing praises and glory to God in the highest because of the great joy that salvation brings. These should be our responses this Christmas. And each Christmas. And really each day. This morning I wanted to bring to your attention a beautiful thing that happened long ago. That God became a human that we might know the love of God. And He wouldn't leave us alone in this dark world. Heavenly Father, we're grateful today, so grateful today, that we could recount the story long ago, centuries ago. And we can retell that story. Our faith is in that story, in the one and only Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, who became a human being, that we might know that you love us. That we might have forgiveness. So grateful for that gift, Lord. The gifts that you brought to us from the eternal throne. Lord, help us share those gifts of love and hope and peace and joy with others. That they too might know the Christ child. They might too know about your great humility and love to them. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.